I love guitar solos. I dedicated most of my work and most of my life to this little art form that is probably dominating only around 30 seconds to 60 seconds in a song. And it all started with one man, Kirk Hammett. But while I get goosebumps while listening to the solos from the old Metallica songs, I can only shake my head and face palm myself while listening to the new Metallica songs. But why do I and a lot of guitar players in this community have this kind of feeling? Is it all just only nostalgia or is there maybe a reason why Kirk Hammett is bad? Hey Guitar Champion, what's going on? I'm Justin Hombach back from my practice cave and welcome to today's video. Before we begin, I just want to say I don't want to bash in this video anything of Kirk Hammett and especially the music back uh, from the first Metallica records that had a lot of impact to me and a lot of other guitar players. But I want to make this comparison between old Kirk Hammett and new Kirk Hammett to find out what has changed and also why his old solos are so legendary. And of course, because this is an educational channel, what you can learn about his old solos for writing good solos. So I'm going to take a deeper look at some of his old solos, his legendary old solos, analyzing them, finding out what makes them so great and why I got goosebumps while listening to them. And then you maybe realize, like I did while I was preparing this video, that most of this stuff is not really happening anymore in new Metallica. All right, when we are learning music, when we are learning an instrument, you can extremely compare it to learning a new language. And a few weeks ago, I was sitting in the car with my good friend Jens, the drummer of Megalife, my mega distribute band, and he's also a teacher for Spanish and English. And there he is saying something to me which is really important for today's video. We were talking about some exams that he had to correct and he was saying that when a student has excellent language, excellent vocabulary and yeah like an excellent technique but has nothing to say and the texts that they are writing are meaningless then it's definitely harder to get a good grade for these kind of students than let's say a student who maybe don't have the perfect technique the perfect language technique to a certain point but the stuff that he or she is writing is just incredible and mind-blowing and really good textures and really good messages inside of these textures that this is more important than having the perfect language technique i think the same is in the case for kirk hammett because as we all know and i don't think that this is a spoiler the execution of a technique in kirk hammett style is really not that good and it wasn't that good back in the day. The left and right hand synchronization is off, bendings are not really in pitch and not really hitting the right note, the vibrato is really shaky, all this kind of stuff. But still, the solos that he wrote, the message behind his solos are relativizing the bad technique. So today I don't want to get too much in the execution of a solo and the technique of Cork Hammett, but for me it's more important to get into what he used to say back in the day and what kind of gibberish he is saying nowadays. So I was listening to every Metallica solo and I was writing all then six pages full of notes and of course I tried to be as objective as I can be but 100% as you might know it's not really possible so your opinion can be a little bit different than my opinion. If I'm seeing something wrong let me know in the comments. This is a place for open opinions and I would love to hear your opinion on the new Kirk Hammett versus the old Kirk Hammett. Alright, when it comes to writing a good solo, again, not focusing on the technique but on the message behind the solo, I think three parameters are really important. First, the phrases that we are writing, our note choices, how we connect those phrases and likely the build-up and the energy of a solo. I'm going to take a few examples and to showcase why the Kirk Hammett solos are actually really good when it comes to these three parameters. So the first section that I want to take a look at to demonstrate some of the parameters is the first section of the solo of Blackened, the first song from the Injustice for All record. And the first section goes something like this. Something like this, not 100%, but 
that's not important right now. What important is, is the riff underneath we are playing the solo. This one goes something like this. Actually pretty simple. We definitely are on the key of E, E minor, because of the G that we have, which is the minor third of E that implicates the minor scale. So yeah, the E minor scale. But there's one problem. This power chord, because here on the second fret, the F sharp, the fifth of it is the C sharp. And in the E minor scale, we don't have the C sharp, we have the C. So now, but the thing is, this happens so quickly and so fast that actually it's not really important that we have the C sharp here. You have to understand certain intervals have certain tension and certain levels of tension. And the more time we give those intervals to develop in our ear, the more important they get. It's different when we're playing a riff like... We only like have an eight notes on, I don't know, 210 or something like this for this one note. That's a difference between when we're playing a riff like Here we are giving the C sharp, the fifth of the F sharp, a lot more space and time to develop in our ear. And over the original riff we could easily say we could play the E minor scale over it, even though there's one note which is on the paper theoretically wrong, but you won't recognize this kind of tension because everything happens so fast. So as long as you don't play the C all the time, you're cool with the E minor scale. But Kirk was thinking like, no, this C sharp, the major six, it's, it's from the Dorian scale. And I want to strengthen that really uh, particular sound of the Dorian scale in my solo. So I hear as well play around with the the Dorian scale where we have the C sharp. So here he's aware of the notes that we have in the rhythm and he's aware that Dorian has a certain kind of sound to it and certain kind of color and he wants to use this color. And this is one of the reasons why this solo is for example so memorable because I can remember that this sound was really interesting for me as a 12 year old kid listening the first time to the solo. The other thing is the build up here. He's starting with the phrase which is, by the way, a counterpoint of this kind of riff here. You can see a little bit as a counterpoint because this one is straight going up while the riff underneath it is jumping between notes, going back and forth, and then he builds it up to the next motif. And then he takes a part of this motif and builds it up to the next motif. So every motif is building on top of each other. Now. We are starting slow, we are increasing our energy, and in this solo, in the later part, it makes boom. The energy is right on there, we're going full in, and now the solo really starts. So here, we don't have this, okay, here's the solo, let's go, uh, solo end kind of method that we have sadly nowadays a little bit more. Here, we are taking our time for a build up, for a little bit more relaxed and chill build up. It's actually pretty slow compared to the rest of the song, but we want to build up to this energy to get the energy back. And you have to understand when you're writing a solo, having everything on the peak of the energy, that's boring. And when you're not building up to the energy, that's boring as well. It's like in every art form. It's like, for example, when you're doing a movie, it's ca it can be extremely boring when everything is like, oh, and there's the killer, oh, and he kills that guy, and oh, there's the evil one, and oh, it's boring. You have to build up to this kind of peak and here they are doing it. So and after this section we have this riff here. So now here we have three ways how you can make a solo over this, how you can make the decision of the note choices. First one is the casual one. This one here, the riff, goes back from the Dorian scale to something which is called the Phrygian scale. So we have again the minor six, but also the flat nine into it. You maybe know the sound. It's really metal kind of sound, really typical for metal. So now you could see all of this riff in, yeah, Phrygian. So you could say like, oh, okay, I just play the Phrygian scale over it, maybe the Phrygian dominant scale to get a little bit more kind of an interesting sound to it but you could see the whole riff as Phrygian. The second way is a much easier way, where I'm going to talk about this in a few seconds. And now comes the third way, that it's a lot harder 
where you need more consciousness about what you are doing here and more awareness about what you're doing here. And it's the way that Kirk actually is using. Because what he's doing here, he is switching between different modes, between the Phrygian mode and the regular E minor mode. Here in the first two bars, we can play the regular minor scale with the F sharp in it with the normal second in it uh, because the riffing underneath it is not forcing us yet to go into the Phrygian mode because we only have here the E and the D but then when it goes to the F it forces us to do the Phrygian kind of scale and there Hammett is also switching from the regular minor scale to the Phrygian scale something like this but here in regular minor scale and then for that no one note he goes to the Phrygian scale he could totally say okay fuck that one note I don't do that one change but he was aware of this change and what kind of cool impact this can have to your solo sound well and what is the second way I guess the second way is the way how he would do it today which is playing the pentatonic over it. Now let me tell you a little bit about the problem with the pentatonic. The pentatonic is a five note scale, five notes. By deleting two notes, we are deleting certain tension points. These are the sixth and the second. Wait a second, the sixth and the second? These are the two notes that are important for a Dorian scale and a Phrygian scale. So you can use this E minor pentatonic, which consists only out of five notes, to play over every kind of minor scale. E minor, E Phrygian, E Dorian, over all of this works the pentatonic. There's one rule, the less notes we have, the less possibility we have as well to have a clash between notes. When we reduce our note choices only to the note E, we can play it over E major, over E minor, over E half diminished, over E major 7, flat 11, sharp 9, what not, fuck it doesn't matter as long as there's an E in it. So you see playing the pentatonic makes things easier but also you are deleting the important notes for a certain color for a certain sound and a lot of things can sound really dull by using the pentatonic especially when you are overusing these kind of blues licks. I mean don't get me wrong there are players out there who can play perfect with the pentatonic and create some really interesting solos with the pentatonic. Angus Young, Eric Johnson, all these guys, they are the master of the pentatonic. But Kirk is not really. And there we have one problem why the solos nowadays don't work with Kirk anymore. Oh, what a cool rhyme. Sometimes in some solos you have some really cool riffs underneath his solo and he's just playing over and over and over again the pentatonic scale and the cliche typical blues phrases. It really becomes a meme about it and the famous Shredmaster Scott channel has made a lot of fun about Kirk simply just using the pentatonic. So you're telling me there's more than just pentatonic? <laughs> Even though back in the day he was capable to do more than just the pentatonic, but why is it so? And here's something which is only a presumption, a supposition. Back in the day I assume that Kirk had more time and more focus for the solo. Like James was writing a song and hey Kirk, here's the demo of the song, can you write a solo? Okay, Kirk was going home to his apartment and then he wrote a solo like for a week or so. And I think nowadays they're doing a lot in the studio on spot as an improvisation, as a jam. There are videos, for example, out there where they're doing the Death Magnetic record and there he is playing all the solos in the studio just improvising them. And improvising is a beautiful art form. I love improvising. I've studied four years of jazz guitar just doing improvisation. But it's not really a good art form when you don't know how to improvise. And you just can't say, oh, then it's more out of your heart and it has more feeling when it comes out of the moment. No, sometimes a solo needs time to get developed and to get composed. It's a composition as well. And this is my supposition. I assume that, you know, like just going to the studio and hey, here's a riff and Kirk, can you play me a solo with four guys around you? And you just noodling around and then the same shit like always is coming out of your guitar, you know? And again, back in the day, I believe Kirk had more time to get prepared for a solo. There's a famous story of the Unforgiven solo where and what was his name again? Bob Rock was telling him, telling him like, Kirk, no, your solo sounds like shit. 
You now get home for a week or so and you work on your solo, you give yourself time and then you come back in the studio with a good solo and he did the Unforgiven solo is a good solo. Hey man, do my homework. <laughs> I do man. This doesn't work. <laughs> The Fade to Black solo is an amazing solo. And of course, he already has there the cliche blues kind of licks and blues kind of material. But he's nonetheless still evolving through that solo and is not only playing those blues cliches. There's this one section after he's playing the first solo with a little bit more kind of bluesy <laughs> phrasing stuff in it, which is totally fine, totally cool. And then he's evolving his solo to this arpeggio section here. Something like this. But don't tell me that you won't be amazed when you were like, I don't know, 12 or something, listening the first time to the right lightning to fade to black, and then this section came up and you're thinking like, holy hell, what is happening here? It is such a cool build up for the energy here. Um, the riff behind it, it's still the same like in the solo before that. The only thing that is changing together with Kirk is the double bass and the drumming there. I think it's like, uh, it's double time, I think, something like that, but there's something changing. The rest is still the same. So the energy that is creating here is not coming from the rhythm section, from the riff guitar, it's not coming from the bass, a little bit from the drums, but it's mostly coming from the solo that we have here. And what he's doing is he is outlining arpeggios of a section where you don't really have chords. So in a way he is substituting a technique that usually comes from jazz guitar players. The last time I heard this kind of thing from Kirk was I believe in the day that never comes. But there the rhythm section is also playing chords so it's not really so it's not really substituting but it's building up energy by going from a bluesy kind of scalar thinking solo to an arpeggio or a chord thinking solo. This is an awesome demonstration how you can manipulate energy in your solo so the next time when you're writing a solo keep that in mind to maybe go from a section where you're only thinking in scales or on one particular scale to maybe okay what kind of arpeggios can I outline with this kind of repeating pattern over my riff. Really really cool what Kirk was doing here back in the 80s not today. And there are such more examples you could go through the entire first four CDs and could listen to every solo and you can find something interesting inside them. Disposable Heroes, yes of course you have a lot of the blues cliche playing in there but you have also the kind of call and response between two guitars in the end which creates a really interesting solo. <laughs> So he always wanted to do something interesting, something a little thing inside of a solo that makes it a little bit more interesting. And this is one thing that I totally miss nowadays. We have one particular build up that is going a lot through Kirk's career, playing the bluesy solo, the typical blues solo, and then going into a melody that he's harmonizing. We can hear it so often nowadays. We have it in 22 seasons and the last single that was released by Metallica, which is a cool kind of song but again the phrases that he's using here are all the cliche kind of blues phrases and yeah he's playing around with a little bit of So this was just improvised. I don't know what I've been doing here, but it was, yeah, you could hear with the Wawa, of course, on a lot of Kirk Hammett, a lot of the modern Kirk Hammett here. And you hear something like this in every solo from the last two or three records. I mean, and they have to say I prefer St. Anger because I don't have the same solo over and over and over and over again. Hot take, I know, but yeah, I said it. Difference that we had as well in the solos back in the day is that how would we connect those phrases. There are more kind of transitions from moti one motif building up to the next motif building up to the next. Now it's one bar this blues phrase, one bar this blues phrase and then that blues phrase and yeah. 
little gimmicks that makes the solo more interesting. For example, Sanitarium. There, the last melody. Oh, it's such a beautiful melody. And then it goes over to the vocal melody. This is really progressive thinking. And now, I don't know. It's just dull. The solos are replaceable. For example, 22 Seasons, Spit Off The Bone. It's kind of the same thing. Just, it's, it, it's not made with conscious anymore and with awareness or with the will to be creative in a certain way. I mean, yes, you might say, and I'm aware of these comments coming on, ooh, they will still do millions because they're Metallica and you are not millions. Who are you sitting in your room and not making millions and not being famous like Metallica, only having 15,000 YouTube subscribers. And if you want to support me then, hit the subscribe. Ooh, you are just jealous, you are just jealous. Yes, yes, I am jealous. I would love to have millions and be famous as Metallica. But they can do those creatively boring decisions because they are Metallica. Now imagine, take the last record and let's say a band that does not have the name Metallica on there will put this record out and do you think they will get famous? I doubt that. Really hard. I, I'm sorry, I doubt that. And this is why I yeah, have to say something about this, because I'm yeah, just sitting here in my room in my little village in Germany, but still there's an opinion I have and there's an expertise I have about how to make solos, and I want to share this with you guys. And I was thinking a lot for the last couple of weeks, why was it so great back in the day and is not now? Is it all just nostalgia? No. There's a reason behind it. And as I mentioned at the beginning, the reason why Kirk Hammett is sadly bad today. But so much for today's video. Let's summarize it. It's important to have an awareness about your solo. The solo for a lot of people out there, conscious or maybe subconscious, the most important section of the song. It's where the peak of the energy is. This is what Metallica teached us back in the day. A solo is a story inside of a bigger story. So I hope you like this little video and I hope you now could see a little bit clearer about the solo style of Kirk Hammett. And I want to encourage you to take a listen and take a view of the solos, the old solos by Kirk Hammett, because from what they want to say to you, the message behind it, they are really good. If you want to support me, then hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, leave a comment what you think about Kirk Hammett's solo style, what is your favorite Kirk Hammett solo, and how does Kirk Hammett have an impact on your playing style like it once had on my playing style. And if you want to hear more of my stuff, then click here from a video of what happens when Marty Friedman would play in Metallica, and check out my big video about speed picking here if you want to improve in your right hand technique. See you in my next video. Cheers, and stay progress. Bye.